Okay, so uh, let's let's go back. So let's uh, talk about recurrent neural networks now. So j someone just pointed out to me uh, that uh, I was saying something incorrect. So regarding the ImageNet problem and the work by Alex Krzyzewski, uh I think at some point I said that they were the first to use GPUs to train neural networks. Apparently, uh, other people did it first. Uh, Jürgen uh, Schmidt Uber. Uh, in Switzerland, the same person who invented long short, long, long short term memories. Um, yeah, so <coughs> so I hope there are not too many imprecisions uh, in, in the tutorial. So, so the motivation to use recurrent uh, neural networks uh, starts with the observation that there is a lot of interesting data in nature that is sequential uh, or temporal. Or so uh, an example is words in sentences. Uh, DNA sequences, uh, time series, like stock market, market returns, uh, and so on. So it's important uh, in, uh, to be able to represent uh, an arbitrarily long history. Um, and this is going to be the roadmap uh, for, for this last session. Um, so here's a recap of what uh, feedforward neural networks are doing. Uh, so this is, uh, let's assume, a simple case for regression uh, <coughs> with a single hidden layer. So we start with uh, an input layer where we just use a weight matrix V and the bias C. So you get this pre-activation, Vx plus C, and you use a nonlinear activation uh, to obtain a representation H. And then uh, at the second layer, the output layer, we just do uh, an affine uh, transformation on H and this is going to become our prediction y hat. Uh, so this is what feedforward neural networks are doing. Uh, recurrent neural networks uh, are doing something a little bit different. So first, they're going to work in different uh, time uh, uh, steps. Uh, so I'm uh, having a subscript t here to denote the time step. And uh, in this uh, initial uh, hidden layer, uh, hidden layer uh, we are not just going to, to use not just the input xt, but also the previous uh, hidden state uh, ht minus one. So this is the hidden uh, the, the representation in the previous timestamp, uh, and this is where the recurrence uh, comes from. Uh, and apart from that, everything is pretty much the same. So graphically, uh, this is what uh, fit for neural network is, is, is. This is what it is doing. Uh, so uh, there might be several units here, several input units, several hidden units, and several output units. Um, but this is propagating everything in a feedforward manner. While in recurrent neural networks, there is kind of a, a, a loop here. So the previous state is uh, uh, going to uh, um, influence the, the generation of the, of the, the next state. So uh, so there is one thing that we can do. Uh, so uh, at first it looks like there is a loop here, but there's there's no loop in the computation graph. Uh, if it just uh, we just need to unroll uh, to obtain an unrolled uh, representation of the neural network. So here we have four inputs. Each input is producing uh, states uh, h1, h2, h3, and h4. Uh, and what happens is that. Each of these uh, uh, states, for example, H2, depends not just on X2 as before, but it also depends on H1. So this is the recurrent layer. Uh, so, but if you look at the graph, uh, when it is unrolled, this is still a DAG. Uh, there are no loops here. Uh, so all these are uh, different states uh, in the unrolled graph. Um, so we can still run the gradient backpropagation algorithm as usual. Uh, so one important aspect, and uh, you know, this, uh, just like in convolutional neural networks, a very important aspect here is that we are tying the parameters, uh, in this case, across time. So the, the, the weight matrix being used here, uh, I think we called it V, is the same weight matrix here. So this is still V, 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 and so on. And in the output layer, it's the same. So here it's W, 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 W. So we are sharing all these parameters for the different time steps. Uh, so the instantiation of gradient prep propagation for the particular case of uh, recurrent neural networks is called, uh, for historical reasons, uh, back propagation through time. So uh, I think that among the first approaches using this, uh, uh, it, it was in speech recognition. 
so, so here's an illustration of uh, parameter tying. So one way of representing that in the computation graph is to have this node, uh, uh, this parameter no node u. This is the parameter that is uh, allowing us to compute h1 from uh, x1. Uh, and uh, we, so we need to, to be able to back propagate the gradients. We need to compute the, the gradient of the function f with respect to the parameter uh, u. And again, we can use the chain rule of derivatives, uh, exactly as, as I explained uh, in the morning, um, to, to compute that by uh, summing for every uh, time step the derivative of the state ht with respect to u times the derivative of the uh, loss function with respect to ht. Uh, so this idea of parameter tying is exactly the same uh, as, as in uh, convolutional neural networks. So here's an example of, of uh, where this can be used uh, in natural language processing. Uh, so let's assume that we want uh, a system that is able to generate text, to generate sentences uh, in natural language. Uh, so, uh, and let's, uh, uh, let's uh, denote a particular word in vocabulary uh, by uh, Y uh, sub T. So typically, uh, as I was saying before, uh, the vocabulary is pretty large, so let's uh, think that it's, uh, let's say, hundreds of thousands. Uh, and each uh, uh, dimension uh, on, on the, the output layer is going to correspond to a single word. So there's going to be, this is a vector of uh, length uh, and hundreds of uh, thousands. Uh, so each dimension could be one particular word, pig, uh, walking, walks, and so on. Uh, and uh <coughs> to generate a word, we are going to have a softmax in the output layer as in standard multi-class classification problems. Uh, and uh, w so th there's a pre-activation here, taking the uh, current uh, you know, hidden layer representation. We can think that this could be much lower dimensional, let's say 300. So this is 300 to 100,000. Uh, uh, and uh, we can obtain a, a, a vector of scores, let's call it Z. This is going to be one score for every possible word by just doing an align, a fine transformation on H, and then uh, doing a softmax over Z to obtain a probability distribution for every word in the vocabulary. So this is generating a single word. Uh, but typically, if you want to generate text, you don't want to generate words independently. You want to condition on words that have been generated already uh, you know, to make it uh, look more, uh, more fluent or more grammatical. So for example, uh, uh, let's, let's, uh, we, can, we can solve this, you can do this dependency by modeling the problem with a recurrent neural network. So for example, uh, if we can start by generating, uh, by uh, obtaining the state H1, then applying uh, the softmax, and let's suppose if you sample according to the softmax, let's suppose that we obtain the word Tom, uh, then uh, what we're going to do is to feed Tom to the input, to the next input, uh, we are going to obtain another state H2, then from that a softmax, let's suppose that we generate likes. So by the time we generate likes, we are taking into account that the previous word was Tom, okay? So in the first input, we just uh, uh, use a special symbol that denotes the start of the sentence. Uh, and we keep doing this. So the next word can be beer, because uh, if you see Tom likes, it's likely that the next thing is going to be beer. Uh, and then uh, we generate the, the stop symbol and finish uh, generating the sentence. So there are two special symbols here, this, the start symbol that uh, initializes the process and the stop symbol that tells us when it should stop. And again, this, is, this allows us to compute a valid probability distribution. Uh, so we can uh, compute the, the probability of a particular uh, sentence, uh, for example, the probability of Tom likes beer, we can compute it as the probability of Tom times the probability of likes given Tom, and so on, until we get probability of stop symbol given everything. And each of these things is parameterized by a single softmax where there is a dependency in the uh, hidden states, uh, H1, H2, and so on, with respect to things that have been generated before. So, uh, but of course we need to train a model like this. So, and to train we need to define a loss function uh, so, for example, let's assume that we have a big uh, corpus uh, of text um, and we just uh, want to maximize the log probability 
of the sentences that exist in that corpus. So you want to train a language uh, generator that uh, generates sentences very similar to the ones that we have in our training data. Uh, so one way of doing that is to use uh, uh, the, uh, an objective function, a loss function, that is the negative log likelihoods of the sentences that we have in the training set. Uh, and then we need to backpropagate that uh, using the, back, the gradient backpropagation algorithm as usual. Um, so this is a standard way uh, language model can be trained. So if you, if you work in NLP, uh, we might have uh, heard about uh, Markov uh, Angular models, which are basically much simpler models that do not involve uh, uh, neural networks, that just uh, try to estimate from n-grams, let's say from, uh, so we need to specify some n here, let's say five grams, so it collects statistics about all five grams that have been observed uh, in the data, and then estimates probabilities probability based on those counts uh, using maximum likelihood. So <coughs> those are much simpler models, uh, but um, they, the, the, there is one important aspect of those models, which is their finite memory. So uh, um, a five gram uh, language model is only going to be conditioned on the last five words that have been generated. So it's not going to be able to remember everything uh, back in the history. Uh, while RNNs never forget. So this is a very important uh, distinctive uh, feature uh, of RNNs. Uh, however, as we're going to see, the fact that they never forget doesn't mean that uh, they can easily uh, take, uh, like use, exploit the, the, the memories uh, that they have. So sometimes they have trouble uh, using their memories. Uh, so uh, there are several algorithms that we can devise uh, using these. We saw already how we can sample a sequence uh, the Tom likes beer example. Uh, we can also train the RNN to minimize uh, cross entropy. This is how we train the RNN to generate language. Uh, and there are other problems like what's the most probable sequence uh, that, uh, that we can also formulate in models like this. Um, okay, so uh, let's take a closer look about how backpropagation is going to work in this case. Uh, so remember that the, 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 in the in the in the NAG in a DAG to for the gradient backpropagation algorithm, the gradient needs to flow back uh, until we up, until we update all the parameters in the network. So in this case, uh, the gradient needs to flow back from the, the loss function uh, and true input versus the predicted inputs. It needs to flow back until the beginning of the sentence. So this can be a very long way until we uh, you know start uh, until you reach the word uh, H1 to complete the gradient, uh, the contribution of this particular word to these, um, to these uh, uh, gradients. So if you look uh, at the gradient again and use again the chain rule, we can compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to H1 uh, as uh, the product of uh, the derivatives, so these are matrices, as I'm using vector, vector notation here, the derivative of vector h2 with respect to h1, h3 with respect to h2, h4 with respect to h3, and then uh, the prediction y with respect to h4, and finally uh, the derivative of the loss with respect to the prediction. Uh, but so if, if your sentence is very large, we are going to have a lot of multiplications here. Uh, this is in general going to be a product over time of, of matrices the, that are describing the uh, derivatives of a state given the previous state. And this is where the problems uh, with RNNs start. So, uh, you know, this derivative uh, can further be split into these two terms. Uh, the derivative of uh, HT with respect to ZT, uh, we can write it as a diagonal matrix. Uh, it's basically just uh, uh, taking uh, the derivative of the activation function on ZT. Uh, but then there is this term that is expressing the derivative of the preactivation given the previous um, uh, uh, hidden states. And this is just uh, an affine uh, transformation, so the derivative is u. So we're going to, we are multiplying u many times in this, uh, in this product. Uh, and there are uh, three things that can happen in this case. Uh, so if the largest eigenvalue of this matrix u is exactly one, so we recall that this u is a matrix of parameters. Uh, so if, if this eigenvalue is exactly one, uh, then uh, the gradient propagation is stable. Uh, if the largest eigenvalue is less than one, then the gradient is going to vanish exponentially fast. 
uh, if the largest eigenvalue is bigger than one, then the gradient is going to explode. So there's going to be an exponential growth here. And this is what, uh, if you might have heard about the vanishing gradient problem or the exploding gradient problem, this is why it arises. It, it's not just uh, arising in the recurrent neural networks. Uh, it can also arise in the uh, you know, uh, fit for neural networks with a large depth. Uh, and it comes from multiplica multiplying uh, you know, all these matrices all together uh, across uh, uh, you know, too, many, uh, too many times. So, <coughs> so we need to deal with these problems. Uh, exploding gradients are easier to handle. There is one uh, trick that people use that works in practice. It's not uh, very uh, nice from an optimization perspective, uh, which is just doing uh, gradient clipping. So if the gradient becomes too large, you can just truncate the gradient uh, and make it smaller. <laughs> so, um, but the vanishing gradients problem is, is more difficult to, to, res to solve. Uh, and in practice, what, is, what the vanishing gradients problem means is that long-range dependencies are difficult to learn. So this is what I meant initially when I said that RNNs uh, have infinite memory, but they can have trouble using it uh, because they might still be have difficulties in learning these long-range dependencies. So what are the solutions to this problem? Uh, so one possible solution is to use better optimizers, like second-order methods. Maybe this helps. I'm not sure how far we can go with this solution. Uh, the second solution is, is to normalize, to keep the gradient norms uh, stable across time. This is, again, a little bit of a hack. I don't know the impact that this can have in the uh, you know, uh, convergence if you are training a neural network with this normalization. Um, another uh, uh, solution that has been proposed is at least to initialize the weight matrices in a clever way so that at least in the beginning of training we start with a good spectra. For example, we could initialize these parameters with orthonormal matrices that have the largest eigenvector uh, equal to one. Uh, this will be one possibility. Uh, the, the last solution, and I think it's probably the dominant right now, but this is not a solved, this problem is still unsolved, uh, but the current solution that most people use is to use an alternative for matrization, such as a long short term memory or a gated recurrent unit, which I'm going to describe now. Okay, so any, any question at this point? Yes. So I have a question. So uh, in matrix machine there are many methods which kind of avoid computing the grain or not directly based on the grain, like uh, co um, let's say coordinate descent where you have a function of many variables and you just touch a hundred graphs one coordinate at a time and do something useful with that coordinate. Mm -hmm. In the context of these networks, which this would look, look like you have this H1, H2 up to H10, let's say, and then you just select a random one of the layers and you just update one coordinate at a time. So you will not suffer implicitly from the gradient. Typically, this slows down the convergence. Mm -hmm. So have these ideas a place in this context? Um, not that I know. Um, so I don't know if that can solve this particular problem because in the case of RNNs, the parameters are going to be shared for all time steps. So you have matrix U, U, U here, everywhere. So even if you just uh, update a single coordinate, this coordinate is still going to be shared across all time steps. So we might still have a problem, uh, like a vanishing gradient problem. Does that make sense? Uh, well, possibly this can be turned around by creating multiple copies and put the penalization term, uh, which will work like if you have the very electrical view, which has many incarnations, the one you wrote here before, you just do this penalization term, which makes them all together, turn together at the end. So this kind of a trick that people also use. So this, in that case, you could use this coordinate descent and make the, avoid through the, the gradient and be sure that you are going to. Mm, yeah, maybe that works. There's been, uh, I've seen some recent, uh, you know, new ways of training neural networks that are not doing gradient pair propagation. Uh, so ADMM that you just mentioned is one of them. Uh, that does this kind of copy, it uses these copy variables and uh, constraining them to take the same value and using the, you know, the, like um, a penalization on the violations of, th of these constraints. Uh, yeah, so I don't know how many of those things have been tried to speci specifically address the vanishing gradient problem, but uh, maybe if you don't use a gradient method, you don't have this problem. I'm not completely sure about that. Not 
Okay. That that yeah, that looks interesting. <laughs> Can you send me the pointers to that literature that you sent that you just mentioned? Okay, so um, so this is uh, basically just explaining the gradient clipping technique to solve the gradient exploding problem. Uh, it's it's as simple as that. So you define some uh, threshold on the gradient magnitudes. Uh, if the gradient is, uh, if the norm of the gradient is larger uh, than its threshold, then you just uh, make sure that it stays, so we just scale it so that it gets exactly that norm, otherwise you don't change it. This is called norm clipping. There is another uh, way of doing gradient clipping, which uh, works coordinate wise. So we just, uh, um, uh, so we, we do the same thing, but clipping uh, each coordinate instead of doing it, uh, you know, instead of scaling the entire vector. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the alternatives to recurrent neural networks. So I'm going to start with getting recurrent units um, and then long, long short term memories, even though LSTMs have appeared before GRUs, but GRUs are just simpler to explain. Uh, so the intuition is the following. Uh, part of the problem with vanishing gradients comes from the fact that we are multiplying um, across time. And, uh, and this is, is, is what's leading to exponential growth. So instead, what we want is the error to be approximately constant. Uh, and to solve this problem, uh, so the GRUs and LSTMs are designed to solve this problem. Uh, they actually solve the vanishing gradient problem, but they still have exploding gradients. So we still need to do clipping or something like that. So is the, is the fundamental idea in GRUs. Uh, so recall that this is what is happening. So to go from HT to HT plus N, we are doing success, success, successive multiplications by a matrix U. Uh, and when computing gradients, you just need to propagate back the transpose of that matrix. Uh, one possible <coughs> way of avoiding these is to have some kind of short, shortcut connections that skip some of the, the, the variables in between. Uh, and uh, in particular, instead of specifying a particular uh, shortcut, we want these shortcuts to be adaptive. Uh, and one way of turning them adaptive is to use some special gates that control when do you want to remember or when you want to forget a, a symbol that has occurred before. So uh, to be concrete, uh, this is the update, uh, sorry, this is the equation for the uh, gated recurrent units. Uh, instead of just, um, uh, so the in, in our hands, what we, what we do is to define HT to be a uh, matrix uh, U times HT minus one plus the bias B. So in GRUs, we do something different. We first compute uh, a candidate update. We call it HT tilde by applying something similar uh, with this difference in red that I'm going to explain now. And then uh, we do the update by interpolating between the candidate updates and the previous states. And these uh, gates UT and RT are called uh, the update gates and the reset gates. So the reset gates, uh, it's, so this is, these are going to be sigmoids defined on the same inputs as uh, the standard RNN. So they also depend on the, on the current inputs and on the previous state. Uh, so because they are sigmoids, they're going to output uh, numbers between zero and one. So this is going to be a vector of zero, uh, something between zero and one, and this is going to be another vector between zero and one, with, with uh, so one number for each dimension. And then we use the reset gates, we do a, a pointwise multiplication uh, involving the reset gates and the previous uh, states uh, HT minus one. And this is going to, if the reset gate is close to, uh, to zero, um, this is going to clear the previous state. So it's going to kind of enforce a reset operation uh, on when computing the candidate update. The update gate is, is, is being used here in the final update rule for HT. So if the update gate is one, then we are actually accepting, if it's one everywhere, we are going to accept uh, the candidate update and, and uh, we are not going to interpolate with the previous one. Uh, but if the update gate is, is a vector of zeros, we are ignoring the candidate update and we are just keeping the previous HT minus one. So this is transferring the previous uh, hidden state uh, as it is to the current time slot. So these are, you know, one way of controlling 
uh, what kind of things get memorized and what kind of things get ignored. So long short term memories, uh, they were proposed kind of using the same idea with more gates. Uh, so the key idea is there is one difference. They, instead of having uh, just gates, they also use memory cells. So there is one cell per each hidden state. So there is also these vectors C1, C2, C3, C4. And then uh, instead of having recurrency on the hidden states, we have recurrency on the cells. Um, but the update rules for the cells are much simpler than the update rules for the, the Hs. So let's look at a concrete example. <coughs> at the concrete uh, definition. So uh, this is how we update cells. Uh, so it's uh, there are again two, ga uh, two relevant gates here, a forget gate and an input gate. If the forget gate uh, is, uh, is active, uh, if it's a vector of zeros, then we are uh, cleaning what's there in the previous cell. Uh, otherwise, we keep that information. The input gate is controlling how much of the input we are going to ac accept. So if the input gate uh, is, uh, is a vector of ones, then we are just uh, you know, computing um, this, uh, uh, this preactivation based on the, the current input and the previous uh, hidden states. And then there's also an output gate that is going to control uh, how much we are going to, so it's, it's, this is going to control if we are going to use uh, the um, uh, non-linear non transformation of the, the cell gate, uh, the, the cell state or not. Um, so this might seem a little bit confusing uh, at first. Uh, there's a, um, a better way of visualizing this. Um, so the, the if the, there is actually a blog uh, by Christopher Ola with, that explains really cl clearly what uh, LSTMs are doing and also GRUs. So if you want to know more about this, I recommend that you read that blog post. So this picture was taken from that blog post. Uh, and um, the way this is working is these three uh, semoids here are representing the gates. So this is the forget gate. Uh, this is the thing that is allowing to forget the past, part of the past. So if this multiplication comes into play uh, and uh, the forget is uh, vector as zeros, this is skipping uh, information coming from the past. Then there is uh, the input gate that controls how much of the input flows to compute the current state. And then there's the output gate that controls how much goes into this tan H that provides the, um, so the next uh, uh, representation for, for this state. Uh, and the, the updates of the cell memory, the memory cell, they don't suffer from the vanishing gradient problem because uh, if you look at the equations, there's no multiplication of any matrix by C, T minus one. So this is, uh, if you forget about this gate, this is just uh, you know, kind of the identity relation with respect to the previous one. So um, to summarize, the, the thing that uh, leads us to not having the vanishing gradient problem here is to use a kind of additive dynamics instead of a multiplicative one. Um, but this problem is, is not solved. Uh, so recurrent architectures are still an active area of research. Right now, LSTMs are very hard to beat. They perform very well for many problems. Uh, but uh, for, at least for me, they look, they look too complicated to be the best uh, solution for this problem. So maybe we still need to find a better way of doing this. Uh, there's also some extensions for non-sequential structured inputs. Uh, so this is in general for recurrent neural nets. There's this thing called recursive neural networks. Uh, not recurrent, but recursive. Uh, which basically apply uh, neural networks for tree structures instead of sequences. Uh, there's also another nice uh, recent thing called pixel RNN, uh, which is a, it's a generative model to generate images uh, by drawing pixels directly. Uh, and it, it's also uh, being generated by uh, an RNN, but a bidimensional RNN. So the pixel RNN is doing something like this. So there's also a version with a convolutional neural network. So this, this uh, uh, is representing the, the inputs. So the, 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 uh, uh, yeah, so the, the image that is being generated. Uh, so we are generating the red pixel uh, and we are conditioning, uh, we are looking at the previous pixels that, it, that have been generated. In this example, we are generating from top, uh, top down and left to right. 
So at this point, we don't see the entire window surrounding this pixel. We're just generating this four. Uh, and we are also, uh, so we are computing a state uh, using a convolutional neural network that uh, uses information from this. Uh, in the example of uh, um, RNNs, these two are recurrent neural networks to generate pixels. This depends uh, just on the previous pixel, in the case of the row LSTM, but also on uh, the previous states, uh, on the previous row, uh, before uh, you know, generating this pixel. So this is being co conditioned not only on the previous states, but on several states that have occurred in the, in the previous row. So this is just a way of showing that you can go uh, to two dimensions uh, using the same idea. Uh, and yeah, so this actually performs uh, quite well. So we might not be able to distinguish any object in these images because there's no real object there. These are just the images randomly generated. But if you don't try to uh, recognize an object there, they look very realistic. Uh, so <laughs> they, they look, you know, natural images, even though the objects are quite weird. But as a generative model for images, the claims is that uh, you know, this generates something interesting. Okay, so some tricks of the trades. Um, so what time is this ending? Just to... Five. Five. Um, okay, so I'm going fast by, by tricks of the trade. Uh, so one, one, uh, ish, one important aspect is that, uh, again, depth uh, usually helps. So we can, instead of just having a single RNN, we can stack layers of RNNs. We can include or not include dependencies from the inputs. And this is uh, getting us to deep LSTMs or deep RNNs. Uh, the standard that people are using are two or uh, from two to eight layers. Uh, it still seems to help to add more depth if you have enough data. Uh, we can also do dropouts. We need to be a little bit careful about dropouts because uh, we cannot do the usual dropouts in the recurrent connections. Uh, and practical implementation tricks. There are a few tricks that, uh, that uh, speeds up uh, the computation. Again, using GPUs is, is, uh, is good. Uh, for performance, um, so there is this uh, initialization with orthogonal matrices that sometimes helps. Um, yeah, so there, there's, a, there's a few tricks. You can you know, look it up later to, if you really want to implement this. So mini-batching is uh, uh, something that is also uh, frequently done here. Uh, so there's a lot of element-wise operations in RNNs, LSTMs, and so on. Um, the typical way we batch is not across time, it's across instances, uh, because there is this dependency with previous timestamps, so we cannot do this computation in parallel. So when, it, when you are generating a state HT, it depends on HT minus one, and therefore we need to do computation in a sequential manner. But we can easily batch over instances. So if you do the same usual padding and so on, uh, we can still batch in that direction. So typically, uh, pretty fast, if you are starting to play with these things, we end up with doing computations with tensors instead of matrices. So you need more dimensions than two dimensions. Um, and you still need to do the same kind of padding, uh, masking, and so on. So bidirectional RNNs are also very used if you need to compute the representation of the, of the inputs. I'm going to come back to this topic uh, you know, when I talk about sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Uh, so in this, uh, this is very simple. It's just one RNN that works left to right and another one that works right to left. And then you just concatenate the two states and obtain the representation of the given inputs. Uh, so there is nothing special here. Okay. <laughs> So let's talk now about sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models. Uh, so those models got, uh, you know, they, they got very popular in the last couple of years. Uh, there's been a couple of seminal papers uh, on this, one from the Montreal group uh, and the other one from, from the, the brain team at Google. Um, so uh, the fundamental idea uh, is to learn a function that maps from sequences to sequences. So the problems that uh, this can be applied to are, for example, machine translation. Uh, people have also applied that to uh, caption generation for images. Uh, in speech, uh, we also need to map from a sequence of audio to a sequence of text and so on. Uh, and the uh, kind of unexpected, at least to me, uh, uh, fact is that we can do almost anything of these with the same kind of model. 
uh, that doesn't need to speciali spe specialize so much on uh, getting the you know, on, on engineering features from the data that we are uh, learning from. So uh, let's first see how we can encode an entire sequence as a vector. Uh, so here, let's suppose that we have a sentence x1, x2, x3, x4, and we want to come up with a vector representation of this sentence. Uh, so one way of doing that is just to use a LSTM or an RNN, a, a, some kind of recurrent network that gives us a vector C associated to the last word, but this vector contains information for all the previous words. Uh, so this is a simple way of computing a, a vector representation for a, a full sentence. And we can do this regardless of the length of the sentence. <laughs> if you have instead a sentence with 10 words, since all these parameters are shared, we can still apply the same RNN and we can still get a vector representation for that sentence. Um, so the, sec the second problem that we're going to talk about is how to uh, uh, generate a sentence condition on another sentence. And this is basically what we're trying to get with sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. So one way of doing that is to, to use an RNN to generate, as shown in the previous uh, section, uh, but conditions on the representation of the sentence X. So the trick is we start with the sentence X, we run an encoder RNN to obtain a vector C, and then we, uh, s uh, we use that vector to uh, condition a generation of the target sentence uh, by using another RNN to serve as a decoder. So this is what is called the encoder-decoder architecture. So this, this, I think this picture makes it uh, easier to understand. So if I have a sentence in German uh, like this, uh, I use an encoder RNN to generate a vector representation for this sentence. This is vector C. And then I use this vector as the initial state for the decoder RNN, and I use this decoder to generate. So the first time it generates the words beginnings, uh, then, uh, so of course, beginnings are conditioned on this representation, and I don't know German, but I think Anfang is probably related to beginnings. So this is probably making more likely to uh, you know, obtain the word beginnings. Uh, then we put beginnings as input to this RNN, you generate R, then uh, we generate difficult, and then we stop. So this is a very simple way um, to generate a sentence given another sentence. Uh, and this looks a little bit crazy how it can work, right? So I mean, I, the first time I saw this, I just couldn't believe that you could do anything interesting with this. An anchor plane. No, you, you uh, so what we are. Uh, more or less. So what we are what we are doing is we we generate the point representation of the sentence, a vector. Uh, I, th I think it's not useful to think of it as an hyperplane because you are not you know separating points with this. So we generate this vector. And then we're assuming that this vector contains every information that is relevant. Any, any information about the source sentence that is relevant is compressed into this vector C. Okay? And now we are going to generate a new sentence providing C as input. Uh, so C is just the initial state of the decoder RNN. Um, and, and then we get something that is actually related to the sentence because C was able to convey all the important information about the source sentence. So we just uh, compute C, we can throw away all the source sentence and just keep the vector C and use it to generate. That's a very good question. So actually the first instantiations of this model, uh, they were trained end to end. Uh, so in this case, the parameters here will be influenced by whatever you do here. So in this case, they were not independent of the target language. More recently, uh, so when I say more recently, it's kind of last week or two weeks ago, <laughs> there's been, uh, I think, like two or three papers at the same time. So this is also another important thing with deep learning, is that uh, if you follow archive, you see papers getting posted every day you know, with new results. So the pace of research is very, very high. Uh, so like two weeks ago, there were two or three groups, different groups, 
doing a, a, I forgot the name that they gave to this kind of multi-way translation where uh, this encoder uh, will be different from that decoder <coughs> and you can do this to work with any pair of languages. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, but uh, the basic idea is that you train end to end. So we we know the so we have training data. So let's suppose that you want to do this for machine translation. We have data that consists of parallel sentences on the two languages, like a English sent a German sentence and an English translation of that sentence. And then you just define a cost function, which can be cross entropy for each word here. And uh, you just back propagate. It's the same story as, as in the standard RNN. Why do you think you can train both languages to a common Yeah. So more precisely, we are compressing the source sentence into one thing and use that thing to generate the target. But yeah, that means that this is probably kind of uh, implicitly compressing the relevant information in this sentence also in a vector. So, I mean, in theory, the model can do that, but of course it fails if the languages are morphologically rich, if they have, uh, you know, there's, a, there's many things that don't work with this standard model. Uh, so then we're going to talk about more uh, evolved models that can address some of those problems. Um, but yeah, conceptually, this is very, very simple. Um, And uh, so this was the uh, Google Brain paper. Uh, so short uh, additional tweaks that, uh, that work better. Uh, using deep LSTMs is very important. If you just have a single <coughs> layer LSTM, you don't have very good performance. There is another important tweak that is reversing the source sentence. So if you, if you do exactly what I described, performance is not going to be good. You get kind of 26.17 blue score. It doesn't matter what blue score means, but higher is better. And if you reverse the source uh, sentence, just doing that, we jump to 30. So we gain four additional points. This is the thing that gives the most of the benefits. And the reason for this is that if you are generating a new sentence, we'd better uh, keep in memory the first words of the source sentence instead of uh, keeping the last words. Just uh, you know, a peculiarity of language. Uh, so other things that help are ensembling. Uh, so assembling is the is um, it's always that sad thing that it always works. It's a <laughs> uh, it's you know very naive way of composing models, but you usually get some boost by doing it. Uh, so depressing if you are doing research. Very good if you are working in industry, uh, or if you care about actually final performance. Um, and beam search is also important to uh, for the decoder RNN. Uh, beam search at uh, decoding time to get uh, uh, you know to suffer m less from error propagation when we are generating the target sentence. Okay, so basically the message here is that before uh, so th this paper was what uh, started neural machine translation, uh, end to end neural machine translation. It's quite amazing and uh, or depressing if you want if you prefer. To think that a simple model like this, in practice, is not as simple as it looks like in this picture. But uh, it's definitely much simpler than the architecture that people were using before in, in phrase-based machine translation in previous statistical machine translation systems that included several models for word alignments, then extracting phrases, uh, using a language model, combining all these scores, and then decoding in a phrase lattice. So these are models that are trained end-to-end. -end. You don't need to worry about any of these. And they and they you know get as as good performance initially now much better than uh, the statistical uh, MT models. So just to give uh, uh, some context here, so 2015 was the year where people started to use neural MT uh, in uh, in machine translation shared tasks. So this is, these are numbers from the workshop in machine translation, and these are uh, you know the best system, the best phrase-based system, the best syntax-based system 
and the best, the best neural system. Before 2015, there was nothing neural. Uh, and just in one year, we already got you know, very big boosts in, in scores, and we are already outperforming uh, phrase-based and syntax-based systems. Um, and it, it keeps getting better. So there are some tricks, uh, particular tricks for dealing with morphology and some of the issues that you pointed out, like working with subword units, using character level models. So it's very predictable that next year's neural MT is going to improve even, even more. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is basically applying the same idea to generate a caption for an image. So we start with an image. This is the input layer. The only thing that we change is the encoder. So the encoder is now a CNN, as I, like a convolutional uh, neural network, as I described uh, two sections ago. Uh, it still generates a vector. And then the decoder is the same, the same architecture. So from this vector, this vector represents the images. It compresses the image. And then it generates a caption condition on this vector, and it's going to generate a spooky old house. Yeah. Is, is this related to your question? Or? Uh, not directly. So, but, so I was asking because suppose I have a, a problem where my input does not have this structure over time. There's not even the concept of time. Mm -hmm. okay, I was just thinking of images I can think of another structure. Sure. But still, uh, I might just for some reason, that I, I want to ask you what could be that reason, I want to force kind of for example, in image, I would see the image as being composed over time as this square over there, then I pass to the next square, the next square, and so on, just because probably um, doing this kind of recurrence um, gives me fewer parameters than if I try to process it in blocks. So the, the analogy here is probably the probability graphic model. So sometimes you have a PDF of many variables, and although you don't have this graphical structure in the PDF, you might hallucinate one just because or approximate, take one as an approximate, just because it helps you with the inference, like you, you put this conditional structure over there. So uh, in, 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 in that situation, the, 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 the policy graph model does not exactly hold uh, for your PDF, but it forces it somehow because it helps in decoding. Could that be the same here? Yeah. That you have a problem, because when you put the, the, the example into the sentences, side by side, so you have a table, you have like a sentence in English and a sentence in German. So conceptually, you could do this with a, with a typical network. I just declare your input as being a sentence, but I guess it will be too overwhelming, right? The complexity will be, the input space will be too big. Uh, but if you factor the input space as a, some word being generated out of other ones, it, you put some structure, it's natural here, it helps you somehow. But suppose I just have a big input space, I don't have the time, I could still do that, right? Yeah, it's basically just uh, changing the encoder. You can, you can have a graph here instead of an image with the graphical model structure. Uh, you just need to be able to convert that into a vector using whatever network you, you have. Though that network can pull features from the graph. For example, it can look at a node and the parents of that node and so on. So and the reason <coughs> that you ask is that because you could not cope with the huge dimensional input space. But if you break them down into small pieces, tied together in time, because yeah. time here is not really like a fictional dimension, but just because you, you scale down the problem it's actually very easy to do that in the input side. So this is very flexible in the input side because at the end you just need to get a vector. It's more difficult to do it on the decoder side because for decoder you need to generate. So we, you can do it with, so with sequences, it's easy. You just generate one state and the next state condition on the previous one and so on. If you have a tree stru structure, you can still do it by conditioning on the, on the children and so on. But if you have a more complicated structure, it might be trickier to, to generate. So I would say that it's very easy to do that kind of thing in the encoder. The, for the decoder, maybe it's not as flexible. But uh, I think there's a long way of you know, new things to be explored here. Um, but it still has some limitations. So this, this entire idea of uh, representing a sentence as a vector can have some problems. So there is a you know, famous uh, remark by Ray Mooney that you cannot cram the meaning of a whole sentence into a single vector. 
uh, so sentences have unbounded length. Vectors have finite capacity, a finite number of dimensions. So does it make sense to always represent an, an entire sentence as a single vector? <coughs> so maybe, maybe it doesn't. Uh, and so one thing that has been suggested uh, to address this uh, is to use an additional <laughs> mechanism um, to, uh, to, to control this and a different representation for the sentences. So what about trying to encode sentences as a matrix instead of a vector? So the idea here is, um, so I have, I have a, a matrix where the number of rows is fixed, like in the vector. Uh, this will be the number of, uh, like the hidden size, uh, the number of hidden units, but the number of columns uh, will depend on the number of input words. So you could have one column for every input word. So it will be a, a matrix uh, whose, uh, whose number of rows, uh, is, is uh, number of columns, varies with the sentence length. Uh, and, and then we need to generate conditioning on this, on this matrix instead of conditioning on a vector. Uh, and this, for this we can use uh, you know, something new that was introduced a year and a half ago called the notation mechanism. And I think it's really exciting and uh, can be used for a lot of different things. So how can we encode a sentence uh, as a matrix? <coughs> so, uh, one simple way of doing that is just to use the word embeddings uh, idea uh, in when I talked about representations. So we can take the word vector for each, for most, uh, and so on, and concatenate everything and form a matrix. Um, so uh, this is fine, but these vectors are not capturing the contextual information. And ours, we believe that you know, the contextual information is important to be able to gen then decode, uh, to generate the target sentence. So this is probably not a very good idea. An alternative is to use convolutional neural networks that can capture contextual information. Uh, a typical choice is to use bidirectional LSTMs, which are basically what we have just seen. So if you have a sentence like this, we can have a left to right uh, LSTM, then a right to left LSTM, and then just concatenate uh, the two states, and we end up with a matrix of six states times four words. Um, so we can, this is now our representation of the, the source sentence. So not a vector anymore, but something that scales with the number of words in the sentence. <coughs> and now you need to generate uh, from this matrix. So let's call this matrix F. Uh, how can we generate from that? So this is where this idea of attention uh, comes into play. This was a paper by uh, Badenau and other people from Benji's group in Montreal. Um, so the idea is to generate the output sentence word by word uh, using an RNN. So far, the same thing as before. But at each output position, the RNN is going to receive two inputs. The first input is a fixed size vector embedding of the previous output symbol. This was happening already. So you're generating a new symbol uh, by feeding to the input the symbol that was uh, generated previously. Uh, the, second, uh, out, the second input is the, the novelty. So we're going to uh, use as a second input a fixed size vector encoding a view of the input matrix by taking a weighted sum of its columns. So uh, there is this, this uh, vector called uh, attention vector or attention distribution. We call it AT. Uh, and this is going to give some weight to the source words that we had uh, coming out from the encoder. Uh, and by multiplying F by this attention vector, we obtain a vector that is going to be a vector representation of the source sentence, but a vector representation that is tailored to the particular word that you are generating now. So instead of having a single uh, fixed vector to generate the sentence and always conditioning on the same vector, every time we are generating a new output symbol, we are conditioning on a different vector that is computed by, computed by using this uh, attention uh, distribution. Um, so, okay, let me skip this and show how things uh, work graphically. I think it's easier to understand. So here's how the encoder decoder with attention works. So again, we have uh, the source sentence in German. We compute the matrix F. This is what we have done before. Uh, we, and then when you are generating a word, for example, let's suppose that we already generated uh, I'd like a beer and we are going to generate a stop symbol. So at this point, we are uh, with these inputs. Th these are the two inputs that uh, are passed as inputs to the, to the RNN. 
So one is an encoding of the word beer, and the second one is something that comes from the attention, uh, and it's just multiplying uh, this matrix F that represents the, the inputs by a vector that tells you how much uh, emphasis, how much focus you should put on each of the four words. So this example is not very enlightening because it seems that everything is flat. But let's suppose that to generate the stop symbol, it's really relevant to, well, okay, let's put another example. For example, to generate the word beer, probably you want to put more focus on the German word for beer. So this would mean that we'll have a larger mass for this word and the other ones will be small. And this vector is uh, you know, just uh, kind of computing a weighted uh, sum representation for this matrix that is going to put more emphasis on the vector representation for the word beer. Uh, and then condition the generation of beer based on that vector. Uh, and so in this slide, I'm also showing the attention history for each time frame, for each word that you are generating in the decoder. So when you are generating the word uh, Eid, most of the attention is uh, focused on the German word Ich. Then for like, uh, it's this German word. Then for uh, it's Ein, and for beer, it's uh, beer. And then for the stop symbol, it's flat across all the words. So this is, we can regard this as some kind of soft alignment. So for those of you who have worked in uh, machine translation, I think I can skip this. For those of you that, that uh, who have worked in machine translation, uh, the traditional machine translation models re uh, relied on this notion of word alignments. Uh, we can regard the attention uh, in these models to play a similar role as alignment, but instead of being a hard alignment, instead of forcing each uh, word in the target to be aligned with a particular word in the source, it's a soft alignment. Uh, and uh, the fact that it's a soft alignment is interesting because you can still train this model end to end. So the parameters for the attention, so maybe I should go back here. So to compute the attention at each time step, um, we are going to do a softmax over a vector. And this vector is going to depend on the, um, okay, so maybe a little bit before that. Um, okay, so to compute the attention, what we're going to do is uh, take, uh, so when you are generating word T, we are looking at each of the words in the source. So I is a particular word, a particular position. We are uh, computing uh, this function that looks at the, um, the state representation for the word I. So this is the I's column of the matrix F. Uh, we are going to take the previous state from the decoder RNN plus a bias. We are going to uh, pass that for, uh, for nonlinearity. We are going to take the inner product with the parameter of the network called V, and this is going to give us a score that tells us how similar is the word that you want to generate now uh, with each of the source words. So we then we collect all the Zs, and we are defining the attention to be a softmax over this Z. Uh, so we get a distribution over this. And all these operations are uh, you know, continuous functions, uh, differentiable ones. So we can still do uh, gradient propagation for the entire graph. It's going to be a little bit of a complex graph, but you can still do it. And it's much easier to do it if you have uh, you know, software that supports automatic differentiation so that you don't need to compute everything by hand. Um, so there's you know, some extensions to this work, um, uh, adding structural biases and so on. Um, uh, so there's also a lot of other problems where this is used, for example, to generate captions for images for speech recognition uh, in memory networks. This is a very exciting line of work uh, where instead of having attention over words, you have attention over a long, uh, a large set of, of data. Uh, and attention is kind of simulating uh, our memory. Uh, every read operation over uh, the memory can be regarded as uh, um, uh, computing an attention function over our entire memory. And we can also do that, uh, we can also simulate a write operation on memory by using an idea similar to attention. And so I'm not giving the details, but uh, putting these ideas together, you get things like neural Turing machines, which are kind of an end-to-end -end differentiable uh, emulation of a computer uh, that some uh, people are, are developing at, at DeepMind and in other places. Um, there's also ways of dealing with sparse attention with sparse max. So, I'm going to skip that part. But uh, so this is our own work 
that we applied for uh, natural language inference. Uh, so the relevant thing here is that instead of using a softmax for attention, we used uh, sparse max, so we get sparse attention. And sparse attention is good because we can identify what uh, parts of the input sentence are relevant to take certain decisions. So for example, the task here is uh, natural language entailment. So we present two sentences and uh, the task is to determine if the first sentence entails the second one, if there is a contradiction, or if there is no relation at all. So there are three possible classes. So in this first example, uh, a boy rides on a camel in a crowded area while talking, uh, talking on his cell phone. And uh, so this is the, the, the premise, and the hypothesis is a boy is riding an animal. <coughs> so in this case, the uh, premise entails this hypothesis because the cam a camel is an animal. And by using an attention mechanism, the words that got selected using a sparse attention, the ones that got non-zero probability, were rides on camel, which are relevant to decide that this is an entailment relation. <coughs> and the same thing can be done for other examples here. So in particular, the last one, which is quite a long sentence, uh, a lot of the words in this sentence are completely irrelevant to the final decision, but the fact that there is the word laughs, seated next, clasping, and so on, contradicts that two mimes sit in complete silence. Uh, so this is a way of you know, selecting, um, like inter interpreting what the model is doing and selecting uh, relevant information, but still using an end-to-end -end differentiable uh, neural network because we can still differentiate over sparse max. Okay, so let's look at a few examples in machine translation and other tasks. So there was a recent uh, uh, paper and blog post by, by Google. They released neural machine translation, I think, in October or something like that. So it's quite recent. There was a lot of uh, uh, you know, noise in the news about this. Uh, and uh, in their paper, they did some internal manual evaluation where they were comparing the performance of the phrase-based machine translation system. So this is the classical statistical MT system that was being used before neural uh, uh, took place. This is the Google neural MT system, and this is uh, the performance of a human. Uh, and if you look at the sentence that is being translated, this is English to French, it's quite complex. It's a long sentence, so it's not uh, trivial to generate a good sentence. So these numbers here are scores uh, assigned by a human annotator where I think the scores go from one to six, where six is perfect. Uh, three is uh, you know, below average and so on. So in this case, the phrase-based MT system generates a bad translation. It gets a score of three. And uh, the Google system and the human performance are in pair. Uh, in this another example, uh, the Google uh, neural MT system does even better than humans. This doesn't happen everywhere. So there are examples where the neural MT is worse than humans. Actually, they, I think their claims that uh, their, uh, you know, achieving human performance are quite exaggerated. It's still very far from human uh, performance. That's why NMEVL exists. Um, but uh, there's also some negative examples <coughs> in, in, uh, in neural machine translation. So it's much better than the other models, but it's still not there. So common uh, error is dropping source words. Uh, since we don't enforce that we need to cover the entire uh, source sentence, sometimes we drop important information. Like, for example, in this uh, source sentence, we should include uh, something uh, like the, this part in blue, and the output of neural MT completely, completely drops that. So it's very fluent, and this is a general pattern in neural MT systems. The output only looks very fluent, but sometimes it drops uh, important information, or it uh, mistranslates an entity in the sentence, so sometimes there are some critical errors. The, another example, which is also common in neural MT, is two repeating things. Like uh, here, the, sh the correct translation should be, it's funny how this always comes up at this time of year. And the translation is, it's funny how this time to come back to this time of year. So this happens quite a few times. It seems to be a common uh, error pattern in neural MT. And then we have crazy examples. So the failure modes of neural networks are really hard to understand. Uh, so in this example, this was a translation from uh, uh, English to Czech. Uh, and I think the, the MT system was not bad. It got good blue score in the end. But for this particular sentence, it got completely crazy. It just generated this. So <laughs> this, this happens sometimes. Uh, so I think that this is a general thing about neural networks. Uh, they, 
are very good at approximating functions, but sometimes they come with a very uh, you know complex uh, discriminating function that uh, if you if you want if you use uh, if you uh, take an input that lies very far away from where the training, training data comes from, the behavior can be very unpredictable. Um, so in caption generation, you can still use an architecture like this. This is also caption generation using attention. So the same architecture as encoder decoder, but now the source is, is an image instead of a sentence. Uh, and um, so here, for example, we have this image. Uh, and when you are generating the word, so this, these captions are automatically generated. And when you are generating the word frisbee, this is where the attention uh, is, uh, is being put in the image. And here, when you are generating dog, we are really looking at the dog. When you are generating stop, we are looking at the stop sign and so on and so forth. So this is, this is quite impressive. Uh, but we also have some extreme examples like these. Uh, I don't know where these images come from. Uh, and the caption that was generated was a surfboard attached to the top of a car, which is kind of, in, I don't know if this is a good caption or a bad caption for this example. <laughs> it's creative. Uh, so I don't know if you have time to go to the, probably you don't. Uh, it's, uh, some people are protesting. <laughs> uh, let me just show one slide, if you, if you agree. Uh, is it fine to stay five more minutes or so? Okay. So, so, the, so far, what we have seen is, uh, going back to the big picture, we saw this part, we saw this part, we didn't see, so we saw autoencoders, but just a little bit of it, but we didn't saw anything below supervised. Uh, and I would say that this is the you know, uh, biggest uh, open problem uh, in neural networks. So we don't have good uh, uh, models for unsupervised learning <coughs> and not very powerful generative models. But there's been some recent work that uh, is pushing for promising directions like variational autoencoders, generative advers adversarial networks, and so on. So, you know, actually some of the generative models boosted uh, the current excitement in deep learning. Uh, so there is an old model uh, called the Boltzmann machine that just connects, uh, you know, uh, variables uh, with arbitrary pairwise connections. These things are very hard to, to compute with. They're very powerful. This is a universal approximator of uh, probability mass functions over discrete variables. But sampling is hard, inference is hard, learning is hard. So there's nothing you can do with this. Um, and part of the, and the big part of the problem is that, <coughs> so we are defining an energy function uh, over a set of visible variables and hidden variables. Uh, but to be able to compute a distribution, you need to compute the normalization factor, which is called the partition function. And it's very hard to compute the partition function with a model like this. So we need to approximate it somehow. But so the short story is that Boltzmann machines are completely intractable, so let's not use them. Instead, there are restricted versions of Boltzmann machines that are more interesting. Uh, so there is the, this class of restricted Boltzmann machines, also called Harmonium. Uh, this was invented in the 80s. Uh, it's the same thing as a, a Boltzmann machine, except that we uh, consider, uh, we have a bipartite graph. So we have a set of vi visible units, connected to a set of hidden units, but there are not uh, any interlayer connections between the visible ones and the hidden ones. Uh, and so the, er the energy function, uh, which is linked to the probability distribution that we're trying to represent, uh, becomes uh, this expression that involves only connections between visibles and, and hidden. Um, so it's still intractable to compute the partition function, but at least we can, there are efficient ways of approximating it. Uh, so, for example, uh, it's tractable to compute conditional distributions. We can compute probability of hidden given visible and probability of visible given hidden. And the reason why you can do that is that since you don't have any interlayer connections, if, uh, if any of these are <coughs> observed, then all these become conditionally independent given those. Uh, so this means that the, the probability distribution uh, will factorize. And since you can compute these conditionals, we can, I mean, for those who are more or less familiar with this kind of thing. Um, this means that you can do um, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo with Gibbs sampling. We can sample efficiently. Uh, it's very easy to compute these conditionals. 
uh, and uh, this makes it much easier to train RBMs because it opens the way to approximate the partition function efficiently. And the reason why I'm talking about uh, restricted Boltzmann machines is because they motivated um, you know, part of the explosion on deep learning um, because they, they are kind of the, the building block to be able to train deep belief networks. So deep belief networks are kind of several layers of these uh, bipartite graphs where all layers have directed connections and the last layer is undirected. Um, but the relevant thing here is that you can train these uh, very deep networks by, so this is still intractable and so on, but you can train them layer-wise in a very efficient manner by uh, training each layer as if it was a restricted, a restricted Boltzmann machine. So you can do layer-wise training efficiently and at the end of the day we're going to have a model for a deep belief network. And finally, the reason why this is relevant is that uh, the first attempts to train a multi-layer perception uh, were actually doing all these turns. So they were training a deep belief network, uh, then, um, then uh, doing that training by doing layer-wise training using Boltzmann, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, and then they just plug the weights of the deep belief network in a multi-layer perceptron and do, they, and do them some discriminative fine-tuning. So this was also a form of initialization, that, uh, and the first one that actually worked in practice. Um, and now no one uses this, but uh, it was historically quite important. Okay, so before finishing, uh, just uh, two models, more recent ones, that are uh, getting a lot of attention. Uh, so one of them is the variational autoencoder. <coughs> so the idea here is um, <coughs> To, to have a generative model uh, that works like an autoencoder. Um, so let's suppose that our inputs, uh, we have images, like uh, images of cats, uh, and the goal is to encode that uh, in some uh, hidden representation so that uh, we can use that hidden representation to generate images that are similar to cats. Uh, and so one way of doing that is to use the neural network to generate parameters of a probability distribution. So in this case, the probability distribution is going to be a Gaussian, and we're using the, um, the neural network to generate the mean, the mean and the variance parameters of that, uh, of that Gaussian. And the reason why this is a good idea is that neural networks are very effective at approximating arbitrary functions. So they are very effective if, at, at uh, you know, uh, estimating means and, var and variances to parameterize the probability distribution. And then with this machine, we can uh, optimize a variational bound on the log likelihoods. And uh, this is going to allow us, so it's not exactly this, but this idea on top of a uh, recurrent uh, network uh, in the decoder will allow us to generate um, things like digits. Uh, in this case, since we are using a recurrent network and a decoder, this is generating these images in different time steps. So this is kind of emulating how people would write uh, a digit without any supervision. Uh, so we start by generating some characters, then we find uh, some, some pixels, then we fine tune them uh, until this finally becomes a digit and you do the same thing for the others. Uh, and this is the entire, you know, all this generative process is being represented by the neural network. And in this example here, we have several uh, numbers that, has, that have been automatically generated from a data set of uh, uh, door numbers. Uh, and the ones in the right are the nearest neighbor of each row. So in some cases, the, the, the things that are being generated are quite different from the actual training points. So the, the network is really being able to generalize and to learn good representations of numbers uh, so that it can generate uh, new examples. So people have used these uh, uh, additional examples to augment uh, training sets and being able to train other models on uh, bigger data sets. Uh, do you find science fiction to, to think that it might be a means to produce papers? To produce papers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends on the kind of papers that you send to, to see if a conference is peer reviewed or not. Or oh, like
uh, the lead decision, let's say the 10th paper, and then the 11th paper, which occurs uh, in time after those 10, then I, I give in this new 10 papers and I get the next one and so on. So somehow there is an intelligence behind this um, construction of papers, which looks at the 10 papers or 15 and says, okay, I see the next steps will be that one. So now let's try to automatize this. So let's try to go to the database of papers in whatever field and display this network and ask the network to predict what is the next step. <coughs> I'm sorry, I mean, in theory, everything is possible, but uh, we might be a little bit far from, from that. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if there was people working on, <laughs> on, on that problem. It looks something that, at, at least to get a grasp of what are going to be the topics of future papers related, related to that one. Yeah, so this, this kind of generative models, they can be used to generate images, text, uh, music. Text is actually pretty hard. Uh, so people have tried to apply variational to encoders to generate text, but the results are not quite interesting. Uh, but, uh, stories. stories. There are scripts for, for producing. Yeah. But te I would say that text seems to be more challenging than images uh, because it's more difficult to grasp the structure in text. Uh, in images, you know, all this adjacency between different pixels and so on, I think they are easier to represent in a neural network. The semantics of text is something that seems to be a little bit harder. So, I mean, I think th this will be done, being able to generate text that looks real. But uh, I think, I, so as, <coughs> as far as I know, I never saw anything really satisfactory to generate text that really look like, you know, human produced text except for short sentences like in machine translation or things that we use condition on other sentences. So generating from scratch, I don't know, I think. Um, okay, so last model, uh, it's a very interesting one. Uh, I think I would bet more on this one as uh, you know, the next big model for generating things. Uh, it's called the Generative Adversarial Network or GAN. Um, and the idea is very interesting. So we have uh, like a game between two systems, a generative system and a discriminative system. Uh, so the generative system uh, is generating uh, data. So we just uh, you know, provide some random variable, uh, like a Gaussian variable, and it's going to generate uh, images, for example. And the discriminator uh, is trained to distinguish real images from fake images. So the fake images are the ones generated by the generator and the real ones are the ones that come from a particular data set. Uh, so uh, in the end, this is going to be like a game, like a settle point problem. Uh, and at convergence, we are going to have the generative model if things converge, because this is the challenging part. But assuming that uh, this will converge, the generative model is going to generate uh, images that are more and more real. They, real. they really look like the real images. And the discriminator will get a performance of 50%, because it's not going to be able to distinguish fake from real more than random. Uh, so I think there's been some recent progress on these networks in the last NIPS conference, which was just uh, held. Um, you what, what? You only train the generator? You train both. You train both jointly. You train the discrimination? You, you train the entire thing jointly. So, yeah. So this is uh, because so the goal is to try and, uh, a system that generates images. It's a game between G and D. It's a game between G and D. Yes. Uh, so this was proposed in 2014, I think, in NIPS, two years ago. Uh, I think I, I never tried this myself, but I think that uh, <coughs> most of the challenge here is in making this uh, you know optimization problem of you know doing these. Uh, this is going to give rise to a settle point optimization problem, and it's tricky to make it converge to a solution that we want without you know, resorting to a bunch of tricks. Uh, but uh, when it works, it works really nicely. So these are, again, examples of images that are generated by GANs. Uh, and so I, I, I never worked on generative models for images, but uh, it seems that these ones are you know, very, very good. Um, so of course, you don't want you don't, so we should be, uh, you should suspect if you see images generated by a generative model that look too real, because it may happen that it's just memorizing the training set. So usually it's a good idea to put the nearest neighbor here, which they don't. But, um, 
but uh, it's still, I don't know, it seems that uh, there seems to be like uh, some kind of animals here. Sometimes it's not uh, coherent as a whole, but um, yeah, it, they look good at least. Uh, but I, I think that this is a direction that is getting a lot of traction. And so this, this ends the, the tutorial. I'm, I'm still amazed that we can, I, can, I could finish this. <laughs> so, um, uh, so deep learning is achieving a lot of breakthroughs. Uh, it's getting mainstream. Uh, mainstream. Uh, I think it's going to have, by now it's safe to say that it's going to have increasingly impact in our lives. Uh, so we are going to be surrounded by technology that uh, we cannot control anymore. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it can uh, lead to uh, catastrophic effects. But uh, it's also going to be able to automatize a lot of things that are you know, uh, difficult to automatize right now. Um, so part of the success of, of neural networks uh, comes from their ability to learn good representations. So uh, this kind of sidesteps the need of doing feature engineering. They are also excellent function approximators. <coughs> and uh, we just need to have enough data to, to train them. If you don't have enough data, so if you, have, if you are working on a new problem uh, that you never saw, uh, and you don't have enough data, uh, don't start by trying a neural network. Uh, just try a simple method. I think it's uh, like uh, shallow classifiers are still things that work well, even simpler things than that. Nearest neighbor algorithm, it uh, sometimes works very well. Uh, but if you, if you are sure that uh, you, know, you have enough data and uh, you, this is the kind of thing that a neural network can do, then they are very, very flexible. Uh, we need also enough computation power to train them uh, so there's many architectures that can be used depending on our input and output formats. Um, I would say that most successes right now are for supervised learning. There's still a lot to do for unsupervised. Uh, there's a lot of things we didn't talk about. For example, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, there's a lot of very exciting results here. For example, uh, that storyline that I showed in the beginning of uh, AlphaGo who beat uh, a human uh, Go player. Um, you know, some of these achievements are in very toy problems, but uh, they already achieved things that were considered very hard very recently. So for example, no one will predict that a machine will be able to beat a human in Go in the next uh, 20 years, and it, it happened unexpectedly. Um, so we can also, there are machines uh, using reinforcement learning techniques uh, with deep, uh, combining that with neural networks that can uh, you know, easily win uh, several uh, computer games, old computer games in Atari. There's a lot of interesting work from Google DeepMind uh, on this kind of stuff. Uh, and I think this is probably going to be you know, the next big thing, reinforcement combining reinforcement learning with neural networks. I think there's a lot of potential for these to, to get uh, more traction. And that's basically it. So um, thank you very much. <coughs> and So I'd be happy to take questions if you have them. <laughs>